And it's now time for the Weekly with News 6 Morning Anchor, Justin Warmith. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Mormuth. It's tough to forecast what November will look like with so much uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus, but already elections officials are making preparations. This week I was able to chat with Seminole County Supervisor of Elections, Chris Anderson, about the adjustments he's already making. How are you getting ready uh, and getting Seminole County ready for future elections? Absolutely. Thank you, Justin, for having me this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, we are um, making tough decisions on how the world will look like uh, come uh, July and August and uh, October, November of this year. Um, so we, uh, we're steadying the ship, but we're doing some things that we believe will be in the best interest uh, to keep everyone safe. Um, we're creating what we call disposable stylus. Um, that's a Q-tip that has aluminum foil tape around it. That will be a one-use one uh, stylus that you can use to sign your name on the iPad. So there's no transference of um, any germs uh, between the election worker and the, uh, and the voter. We also are going to make sure that all of our election workers have the proper uh, protective equipment with gloves, masks, uh, hand sanitizers, uh, wipes to wipe down all of the voting surfaces, and we're even going to have one use secrecy sleeves. So it means when we, whatever we hand you, it will be one use. And uh, for every voter that comes in and votes uh, either early or on election day. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've seen some states go strictly to uh, mailing out ballots. And I know that a lot of people are seeing the headlines of Californians saying it's just going to be mail-in ballots. I think that they're just mailing ballots to every uh, voter and then they're going to be making uh, changes to some of the voting sites and still have those available. Is, has that been uh, thrown around? And, and do you think that could ultimately happen in Seminole County and the state of Florida? Well, the, we don't have enough time as it stands right now. Um, it, it, a lot goes around having to do an all mail ballot uh, election. Uh, in the state of Florida, it's actually, uh, it will require a statutory change to have a mail ballot election because you can't put candidates on an all mail ballot election the way the law reads now. So that's one thing. And also just the sheer materials, having enough materials, be it the envelopes, the secrecy sleeves inside of them and the envelopes themselves uh, for all 67 counties, some are larger than others. Uh, you know, you take Bay County and Broward and Palm Beach, they have, uh, uh, somewhere between 1.5 and uh, a little bit less than a million voters. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of ballots to, to send out. And also the processing and counting of them and having your election results at uh, 7 p.m. as we all would want to have it. That would take, uh, that, it would take a lot of time. And uh, folks that have been doing a little bit longer than me, I've listened to a lot of the podcasts and uh, states who've done it, uh, and that do mail ballot election, it takes quite a while to transition over to something like that. But in Seminole County, we came up with something called the choice is yours. Uh, we realize that some people are going to uh, want to vote by mail because they feel as though that's the safest method to do it. Um, what we did is we created, um, we have a mailer that we sent out. Uh, it's in, it is in every Seminole County voter's home now which was always uh, budgeted, which was their voter card. It tells them all their voter information, where they're going to be voting. And at the uh, bottom of it, we attach the mail ballot request form. So all 300 and around 18,000 voters have, uh, have an opportunity to do a mail ballot request. That gives us the time to process that request to make sure that they do receive a ballot. But that doesn't lock them in. They could choose to go and vote at the polls, um, if things get better. So it just has a request on file with us, which means we will still send them a ballot. They can choose to use it or they can surrender it at a precinct on election day and get a, a new ballot. So we made that decision very early on to get that out. It uh, didn't put a burden on any taxpayer dollars. It was done. Uh, we combined the two mailers essentially. So we didn't pay anything additional to give every voter in Seminole County the opportunity to uh, vote by mail if they choose to. States control elections and then yeah. counties control their individual elections. The federal government does not. However, we have been hearing 
uh, some rumblings uh, from Congress as they continue to mull over some ideas uh, in the stimulus packages and, and coronavirus relief packages uh, to put some uh, different things in there to either delay or th there's just that conversation um, about the election. Do you think that it will stay where it stands today and that states will have control over their elections? Well, I certainly think they're going to be uh, pressed against the clock. I mean, the, the clock is ticking. We have to send out uh, our ballots to our overseas citizens and our military 45 days prior to an election. So this is not a decision that you can make uh, off the cuff, if you will. It, that decision would have had to have been made uh, probably quite a while ago. I think the window's closed for that. Um, I think we have to move forward and uh, states uh, will have to support their uh, supervisor of elections with making sure that they have uh, the supplies that they need to service those folks. Because, you know, I'm talking to voters every day and there are some voters that are just, I'm going to the polls. No matter what, how bad it gets, we are, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna vote at the polls, Chris. And I said, absolutely, no problem. The choice is yours. Whatever you decide to do, we're gonna make sure that it's safe for you, which gave them a sense of calm. And I think that's really important for leaders in every area of government to do is to make sure that we issue a sense of calm to all of our constituents and make sure that they understand that we're doing the best that we can, that their government's working for them and not against them to make sure that whatever they choose to do, that it's going to be done safely and that we're concerned. You know, we're talking about social distancing. The one thing, Justin, I think that it's important that we address is to make sure that voters give uh, their supervisor of elections. Here in Florida, I can speak directly to in, in even more Seminole County that they give us the same consideration that they do when they go to Home Depot, when they go to Walmart or Publix, because we're gonna be required to adhere to those social distancing and occupancy room rules as well. So that's the one thing that I wanna make sure that the viewers understand is that, you know, we have to adhere to all those rules as well. So there may be wait times if you decide to vote early or on election day. I don't say that to discourage you, just ask that, you know, you give us the same courtesy because I do it right. You know, I go to Publix and I'm actually talking to the folks and asking them, well, how are you doing this? And, and you know, what made you decide to do this and getting some ideas of how we can transition that into what we do in the precinct at the precinct level. We took our training room and we turned it into a precinct and we're walking through each step of the process. And, you know, when the social distancing and stuff lifts, I'd love for you to come down and take a look at it. You know, from putting the tape on the ground, distancing six feet, spreading out the voting booths, the stylus, we're creating 80,000 uh, stylus. That's what we project that we'll need. The use of the uh, secrecy sleeves. We're trying to make sure that every piece of the process is safe. But we do ask voters to give us the same consideration that we have to when we go to any, when we're dealing with anything else in life when we go to stores. Still ahead this morning, a conversation with Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lima about the mental health concerns he has during the pandemic. Keep it here. This is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmuth. Welcome back. I'm Justin Warmuth. With so many folks losing their jobs, stressing about finances, the pandemic could be taking a toll on their mental health. Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lima joined me this week to discuss what he's seeing and why he's so concerned about the jump in opioid use. Do you think Seminole County residents have done a good job uh, following these recommendations, these orders, uh, as we get through this really difficult time? Yeah, I, I think our community has done a, a remarkable job. I, I really think that uh, the Central Florida community as a whole uh, really has uh, really come together uh, to support one another. I think when the CDC guidelines are put out and the health experts are kind of helping shape our opinion of how significant this, this is or could have been. Uh, companies and businesses and individuals abiding by the social distancing standards, uh, wearing masks out in public, I think has really resulted in, in flattening the curve, as they say, mm -hmm. and not having some of the tragedies that we've seen in other uh, parts of the world. Uh, very proud of them. And, you know, a lot of this was self-initiated by businesses, individuals, and 
everywhere I've gone, uh, people seem to be taking this very seriously. What are you seeing in Seminole County? Um, take me, take me to the streets. Is crime down? What is it? What is it like to be um, in Seminole County to live through this? Yeah. So, so we've had you know uh, weekly news conferences, and the first uh, three or four weeks of those news conferences, I would report about a forty percent reduction in crime. And the reason why I would do that is is really just to provide a snapshot of what's happening out there in the neighborhoods and communities. So when you close uh, a lot of the the uh, businesses down, there's less of an opportunity to get into um, trouble uh, when you don't have you know liquor being sold in the businesses. Typically, you know that generates a lot of calls, especially in the weekends with with bars and, and different establishments. But people have been staying home. Uh, you know, there have not been uh, one uh, incident that I'm aware of that required law enforcement's uh, presence and enforcement activity reference to COVID-19. Now, I will say there are certain things that I am alarmed about. Uh, you know, with the reduction in crime, there's also a reduction in uh, Baker Acts, and there's a reduction in uh, abuse, neglect, and abandonment of children. Now, here in Seminole County, we, we are the primary investigating agency of, of those types of crimes, abuse, neglect, and abandonment. And I really feel that the reduction in those numbers are not because of something positive has happened, but rather they are limited and children are limited in their exposure to those first responders and uh, mandatory reporters that, that really occur at school. I think on the tail end of this thing, there's going to be uh, a lot of work for us to do as a society when it comes to substance abuse, mental illness, uh, you know, uh, providing the, the help that people really need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, opioid use was a crisis um, before these stay-at-home orders went into place. Do you think those stay-at-home orders and this pandemic as a whole exacerbated the already big problem? Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think that it, it does and will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incredibly important for us not to take our eyes off the ball when it comes to opioid use disorder. And as you know, Justin, we've we've created some initiatives here with partnering organizations throughout the Florida area and have had some success with that. Uh, not as much success as I think that needs to occur, but we're still at a point in the state of Florida that we we uh, have 15 people that are dying a day of opioid use disorder uh, as uh, from an overdose. Those numbers have not trickled down; they have not uh, gone away, and I suspect that. Uh, the unintended consequence of, of COVID-19 will be an increased dependency on services for mental illness and substance abuse. We know that stress plays a factor into all of these things, and, and I think that uh, we will have to pull together as a community and address those things as we rotate back out to what our new norm will be. Right. Yeah, you know, as you know, I don't have to tell you this, but people losing their jobs, um, trying to make ends meet, their finances being wiped out through all of this just makes that problem even worse and kind of puts people over the tipping point of, um, you know, some of their mental illnesses that they might be dealing with. It's just, uh, it's a problem. You, you mentioned uh, domestic violence and child abuse. All of those factors kind of play into it. And it, at this point, you know, it's kind of struck me that those, are, those numbers are down but they're not really down, right? Just it's because they're not seeing someone on the outside, a teacher, an administrator, uh, when it comes to kids or maybe a coworker if it's a domestic violence situation, right? Yeah, I mean, that's my hypothesis. I mean, if you think about the amount of abuse and persons crimes that were going on that were domestic related, uh, I can't think that spending more time uh, with one another in a less visible type of environment as people are sheltering in place leads to less criminal acts. I, I think that sometimes the numbers can be deceiving. And I think that it's going to be incredibly important uh, for us to, to really focus on doing a better job when it comes to uh, providing adequate services for mental illness, substance abuse, all of these things. I mean, we, we really recognize over, over the years that crime and community concerns are symptoms of other problems. And I would argue at the top of that list is going to be mental illness, substance abuse, and you know, all of these things. And 
what's great is uh, all of us recognize that, you know, especially here in the Central Florida contiguous area and, you know, counties and, and cities are working hard to make sure that we're uh, providing adequate services. But hey, let's, let, let's be honest, we're, we're still behind on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, Florida is, is um, not properly funded when it comes to mental health programs. I think that uh, Governor DeSantis and First Lady Casey DeSantis have really uh, uh, said that that's going to be one of their priorities going in. And you know, prior to COVID-19, I know that I've had the opportunity to personally work with them on various committees and boards. But uh, we're really going to have to do something to provide the help and support uh, for these individuals when we come out of this COVID-19. You know, we've seen numerous jails and prisons uh, overwhelmed with the virus around the country. How is that going for you in Seminole County Correctional Institutes? Yeah, so we've had great success with that. We've had, you know, knock on wood, no uh, COVID-19 cases uh, in the Seminole County Correctional Facility. And I think that that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, one, you know, we came out early and said that a consequence of violating uh, CDC standards or county ordinances or state law should not be taking somebody to a correctional facility. Um, I would argue that that would only make the consequence a greater health risk than the violation in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we've encouraged our uh, deputy sheriffs and the chiefs of police have encouraged their police officers to uh, direct file on cases, especially misdemeanor cases where where there may be a violation and, and you know we're not saying that people should get away with committing a violation but rather uh, give them a summons to appear in court as opposed to having direct contact with the law enforcement officer putting them in the back of a patrol car potentially risking a spread in our correctional facility mm -hmm. so as a result of that our population uh, in our jail is down uh, and what we did was we quarantined people on the front end of that so if somebody was being introduced into the facility and some people just simply have to go. I mean, there's violent felonies, there's people who need to be incarcerated. When those people were introduced, they would then be quarantined for a designated period of time uh, to make sure that they are not introducing a potential uh, virus into the general population of the facility. Mm -hmm. We owe that to our public and community, our staff members there, and the inmate population that's inside. And my thanks to both Seminole County Sheriff Dennis Lima and Seminole County Election Supervisor Chris Anderson for their time this week. As always, you can get the latest coronavirus news on clickorlando.com slash coronavirus. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.